welcome to Church Online here at Victorville First Assembly. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. As we are in Thanksgiving mode, can we reflect on all of the great things that God has done in this season? With that in mind, we're going to enter into a time of worship. So let's celebrate big and let's worship big because God is good. We're here to worship. We're here to give him the highest praise. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. No matter what, I won't stop praising his name. Anybody with me? I give you glory. All you've brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Moving forward, follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Your presence is in all. In every season, your grace has been enough, and I'm believing the best is yet to come. The cross before me, my hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, the best, the very best is yet to come. Give God a shout. Give God a shout of praise. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is 
all we want. It's an open door. So come, come now, Lord, Lord, like never before. Oh, hallelujah in this place. We praise and we bless the name of Jesus. Truly, he's worthy to be praised. Amen. We can search everywhere, but we can only find happiness in him. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came alone and put me back together. That's what he does. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, your present. Oh, there's nothing. Come on, we're not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. See, does it's the God of the mountain, it's the God of Your mercy and grace won't find me again and again and again. Oh, there's nothing yeah. better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, no. Nothing is better than you. Come on, sing that again. Oh, there's Everybody sing this in unison right here. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. One more time. You turn morning to dancing. Morning 
God, we just praise and we bless you today as we worship. We give you glory and honor because truly there's nothing better than you, Lord. We bless and we just give you the glory. Thank you for letting us worship. We just bless you and we praise you and we thank you for your awesome goodness, God. In Jesus' name we say amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head down, I will sing of the goodness. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am faithful I will sing of the goodness have led me through the fire darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend yeah oh, I have lived in the goodness of God Sing this. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so. 
In times of uncertainty, there is nothing more than we need than Jesus. Jesus, there is nothing else we need more than you now. With that in mind, will you lift your voice, lift your hands as we seek the Lord in prayer today. Jesus, we love you. God, we're grateful for what you're doing. In the midst of uncertain times, God, we know that you are in control. God, I pray for those in the hospital now. For those battling COVID, for those battling sickness, for those battling cancer. God, you're the healing touch that we need. So Lord, I pray that your comfort and your peace would surround the families in need. God, I pray for those on the front lines of the healthcare department. God, you know what we need. For those battling fear and anxiety, God, your comfort and peace is what we need. More than anything else, Lord, we need you. So, Lord, today I pray just against the spirit of fear, God, the spirit of anxiety, the spirit of loneliness. God, we are together as a church family, and you are there in the core, in the midst of it all. So, Lord, today we love you. God, we thank you. Keep doing your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanksgiving week is upon us. I can't believe it. In fact, I haven't even bought a turkey yet. But one thing is for sure, God is worthy to be praised. And there are so many things to give thanks to God for. God has made a way throughout this entire year. And I want to remind you, church, that he will continue to make a way for the rest of 2020 and beyond. Today, as we reflect on God's goodness, I want to remind you that we can never outgive God. And as we prepare our hearts to give unto the Lord in our tithe and offering, don't forget that your giving is what allows us to impact our community and continue to share the good news of Jesus. This Thursday, in fact, on Thanksgiving Day, we have an amazing Thanksgiving outreach. And we want to thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord. There are several ways that you can give today. You can text VF Assembly to 77977. You can always go to our website at vfassembly.org and click on the giving tab. You can drop off a check at the church office throughout the week or join us for one of our weekend services. But thank you for your faithfulness and generosity to the Lord. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your constant provision throughout this entire year. We reflect on your goodness and we always want to function out of gratitude. We want to live our lives with a heart of gratitude. Lord, you have made a way and you will continue to make a way. God, I pray for those who are in need in our community, those who are in need watching. Would you continue to provide for their needs? Would you continue to, Lord, open doors of employment? opportunities, Lord, to, so that, Lord, every family would be fed, every child would be taken care of. We believe that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and we grab a hold of your promises. And Lord, for those who have been blessed, those who have jobs and are in this season, maybe even a prosperity, would you, Lord, remind us and remind every single one of us that we have been blessed to be a blessing. Whether we have much or little, you call us to be givers, and we give with great joy today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we ask that you continue to provide 
throughout our church, provide for all the things, all the ministry work that is happening. We thank you because we believe that many more salvations will take place even throughout the rest of this year. And we believe that greater things are coming. We trust you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you for your faithful giving unto the Lord. Let's continue to prepare our hearts as we receive the message. Though I wake to a world with more questions than answers, where dissonant voices ignite division, my heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain, and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. And though the struggles I face may be painful, though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice, but it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone. I choose thankful. This week of Thanksgiving, may we not only be thankful, but may we choose thankful. May we be people who choose to be thankful in all circumstances. This year has been a very difficult year. Maybe the most difficult year you have faced yet. And yet in the midst of that, we could be thankful for who God is. On Thanksgiving Day, we're going to have an amazing outreach that will take place. Touching lives outside in the parking lot. Providing clothing. Providing some food, providing boxes to be able to take home. And as we provide those things, we want you to be a part of it. If you're able to come and join us for that Thanksgiving outreach, please do so. But in addition to that, would you be praying for those who may be a little bit less fortunate on this Thanksgiving week? May we choose to be thankful in the midst of the blessings that God has given us. And may we choose in turn then to reach out and touch someone else's life. Today, as we continue in our sermon series called The Kingdom, I want to remind you that as we've looked at this over these last three weeks, that 162 times in the New Testament, and specifically in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the concept of the kingdom is given. That Jesus talked about it. That he wants to bring the kingdom our direction. But today, as we, we look at the importance of the kingdom, we want to talk about the kingdom now and the kingdom then. In week one, we looked at being a citizen of heaven, being a citizen of the kingdom, and what it, what it really means to be a citizen of heaven. And in week two, we talked about governance and, and the politics of heaven, that it's about the king's domain. It's about his kingdom. It's not about your voice and your vote, but it's rather about what he wants, his pleasure, his choice, his will, his way. Last week, we then looked at the 
idea and the notion of, of, of being Christ's ambassador, that, that we would carry that message, not just being a citizen in the kingdom, but that we, that we would be a representative of the kingdom, that we would represent him well, that we would speak on his behalf, that we would defend the faith, and that we would be reconcilers of people back to God. Today, as we look at the idea of the kingdom now and then, there's such an important thing we must understand that part of the kingdom has already come our way, but yet there is so much that is yet to come. The now and the not yet. Let me give you five principles, if I may, today regarding the kingdom of God and how we need to understand this as we bring this series to a close. Number one is that Jesus has brought the kingdom near. Jesus has brought the kingdom near to you and to me. It was John the Baptist who first introduced the concept when he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And as he preached that good news, he, he said the kingdom of heaven has come near. And, and Jesus, in the very next chapter in Matthew's gospel, picks it up in verse 17 of chapter 4 where he says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In Mark's gospel, chapter one, verse 15, it said this way, the time has now come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The good news of the gospel, the gospel message, that message of salvation, that, that the kingdom has come our way, that Jesus has brought a slice of the kingdom and he represented it so well while he was here on earth. We got a glimpse of what the kingdom is all about. I think it's really important for us to realize that the church is not the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. That as we attend a local church, the church again is not a building. It, it, it's the people in, in the midst of that church family and that sense of community that's built within a local church. And it is interesting also to say that you could attend a local church and not be a part of the church. In other words, you can warm a pew, you can sit in a seat, but unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're really not a part of his church. You're just warming a pew inside a building called a church. And so we must surrender our lives. We must receive Christ into our lives to be a part of his church, capital C. As we're part of his church, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so he will build his church. The church is the agency to move forward, to, to be able to encourage people, to strengthen people in their faith, in their walk with the Lord, and, and to invite other people to join in and be a part of that amazing kingdom, that amazing opportunity. But the church only sees a glimpse of what the kingdom is about because the kingdom of God has so much more to offer than what we see on this side of eternity. So the church is a part of the kingdom, capital C, the church is, but the kingdom is so much greater, so much bigger. So Jesus has brought a slice of the kingdom to us. A second thing that we must understand today, yet the kingdom, secondly, the kingdom is still to come. It's the not yet part. It's the part that is still in front of us. Jesus, when he was on trial, standing in front of Pontius Pilate, Pilate was asking him some questions, questioning him, and, and Jesus responds to him in verse 36 of John chapter 18. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. And so the kingdom, when Jesus came near, Jesus brought the kingdom our direction. We got a glimpse of it here as he, as he unfolds in the New Testament, but there's so much more to the kingdom. And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. There is something still yet to come. 
The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18 makes this statement. He says, the Lord will rescue me from every, every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The new kingdom, that kingdom, that heavenly kingdom, that place that we are looking towards, that there is more yet to come and that Jesus will usher that in. If we were to jump to the book of Revelation, we would see Jesus making this statement, I, I, I saw a new heaven and new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. So just as Jesus was Emmanuel, he was God with us and he brought the kingdom our direction. So there is more to the kingdom that will come our way that the Lord wants us to be a part of his kingdom. The kingdom is still to come. These next three principles become so important then for us to understand as we grasp the power of the kingdom. Number one is that the kingdom is our inheritance. The kingdom is our inheritance. We go to Matthew's gospel in in chapter 25, verses 32 through 34, it says this, all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit, say it out loud, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. Jesus, in one of the other gospels of the gospel of John says, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So the kingdom is about an inheritance, about something that you and I will receive. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll receive the kingdom. The kingdom will be your inheritance. It's powerful. In 2 Peter 1, verse 11, the statement is made, Then God will give you a grand entrance. I love that. He'll give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I look forward to that day that the Lord would welcome me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Words that are incredibly powerful, that grand entrance, that opportunity, come in, come in, join me in the kingdom. An opportunity for me to be with the Lord forever. You can have the same opportunity. In fact, so many of you watching online, you've already made that decision in your heart and your life to receive Christ into your life. And if you've done so, that inheritance is yours. Flat broke and homeless. Two brothers by the name of Giza and Zelot Pilati literally lived in a cave near Budapest for years. They left their home only to scrape together whatever money they could through selling scrap metal and candy. Theirs was a hopeless situation. But then everything changed. One day, out of the blue, charity workers informed the brothers that they had inherited a substantial portion of their late maternal grandmother's, get this, $6.6 billion fortune. And just like that, the two destitute brothers, should they want to, could call a castle their home when all they had ever known was a cave. I share that with you today because it is so important for us to realize that what we have on this earth, no matter how good, how amazing, or, or how, how just average it may be, what we have on the other side, what we have as an inheritance in the kingdom of God is so far beyond what we could ever even comprehend. 
That's how great our God is. As Jesus says, I'm going to prepare that place for you. What we have on the other side, what we have to be able to have as an inheritance that will come our way because of our relationship with Jesus Christ is absolutely mind-boggling. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 makes this statement. And it says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. To share in that inheritance. So the inheritance is for you, but it's also for anyone who would choose to believe. That we share this inheritance together, this amazing gift of the kingdom of God. Wow. A fourth principle that we must understand that as the Lord moves forward in that concept of the kingdom that is not yet but is still to come is that there will be a clash of kingdoms. So important that we realize that today. There will be a clash of kingdoms. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15 this statement is made. It says, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven. Here's what it said. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. I I have the Messiah's, Handel's Messiah's hallelujah chorus in my head. And he will reign forever and ever. What an amazing thing to inherit that the clash of the kingdoms will take place. That the world, the text says, has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. In other words, Jesus will usher in a brand new thing. It's so important that we realize that. Several years ago, Johnny Carson, the late night talk show host, had Billy Graham on his guest on the show. At one point, there was a lull in the conversation, and Johnny said, and I quote, you know what, Billy? I bet if Jesus ever came back to earth, I bet we'd do him in again. In other words, take his life again. To which Billy Graham, and it makes me smile as I think about him doing this, It says that he leaned forward in a seat and said, Johnny, in the Bible, we read that Jesus predicted that he would return to earth again. But the first time he came in love, the next time he'll come in power and no one will do him in. There will be a clash. There will be a war. In fact, if we pick it up and we understand what Revelation 19 says to us, that Jesus will be coming on a white horse. A white horse. Let's let's make sure that we, we kind of juxtapose these together today for a moment. And that Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, when he was on this earth, on what we refer to as Palm Sunday, came riding in on the colt of a donkey. A donkey that had never been ridden before. A donkey representing peace. Jesus came into Jerusalem representing peace. He brought love. He brought compassion. But there will be a day where the Lord will return and he will be riding on a white horse, that horse representing war. In fact, the text goes on to say exactly that, that he will make war and that the armies of heaven will come with him, also dressed in white, riding on white horses, That Jesus, who in that chapter is referenced as the rider, is faithful and true. And out of his mouth is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In other words, he will speak and things will happen. This clash of the nations. You know, it kind of takes me all the way back to the book of Genesis for a moment. That in Genesis chapter 1, that God created the heavens and the earth, and he did so by speaking it into existence. Ex nihilo, out of nothing, God created. Amazing. And and as I think about how he speaks something into existence, he speaks things 
into being or becoming something. The war that is outlined there in Revelation 19, where Jesus will overpower the kingdoms of this world and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. It's powerful, friends. Someone once asked me the question, the book of Revelation, it's, it's kind of tough to understand. Can you explain it to me? And I said very simply, here's, here's what you need to know in short form. Jesus wins. It's just that simple. Jesus wins. His kingdom, who he brought to this earth in his first coming, he brought a sliver of it, he brought an understanding of it, and yet there is more yet to come, so much more yet to come, and he will win. When you get discouraged, just pick up your Bible and read the last couple of chapters of the book of Revelation, because it'll bring you encouragement in your heart, at least it does for me, and reminds me that in the end, you know what? He wins. And it's really cool to be on the winning team. And when you invite Christ into your life, you're on his team and you end up winning. You end up inheriting the kingdom because he has created it for you and for me. That leads us to the fifth and final thing I want to share today. So let's review real quickly. Jesus brought the kingdom near when he came the first time. Second, yet there is still more of the kingdom to come that the kingdom is about our inheritance and what is gonna come our way, the blessing, the favor of God that will come our way. Fourth, that there will be a clash of kingdoms and Jesus will win. And fifth, that Christ's kingdom, when it wins, there's three important things we must understand today. It's all about his presence, his authority, and his power. Say it with me. Presence, authority, and power. I take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 23 through 25. It says, but each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That text that I just read talks about presence, authority, and power. In other words, it says, and when he comes, there's something powerful about God's presence. When God shows up, it's always different. When God shows up, he changes the circumstance. When God is present, it is powerful. Friends, that, that's one of the great things about what God says when, when two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in the midst of them. When we choose to gather, when we choose to come together and we worship the Lord, it is a great thing because his presence is powerful. With that as well, it's about his authority. It says, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God. He hands it over. In other words, he has the authority to hand this thing over. When he wins the battle, when the clash of the kingdoms that come together and Jesus wins, Jesus wins that battle and those who are with him are on the winning team. When all of that takes place, then we know that the authority has been issued. The authority has taken place. Jesus even referenced it in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. We tend to quote the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. What we tend to miss is the verse exactly preceding that, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus spoke that to his disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. The authority. The one who has the authority has the ability to make it happen. Ability to accomplish what needs to be done. And Jesus has all authority all the time. That leads us then to the third word, and that's power. Power. The dynamic power of God, and 
It goes on to say that after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, and he reigns and he puts his enemies under his feet, that's power. That's the evidence of the authority is then all the power of God being there, that, that the Lord is all-powerful. There's not anything that's going on that is beyond his capability. Jesus will never say, the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit will never say, the, the Trinity will, will never say that, wow, I can't do that. That's beyond comprehension because it's always within his capability. It's always within God's capability to handle anything. Now, you may ask, what's the big deal about the presence and the authority and the power? Because because we we can bring more of a slice of heaven, more of the kingdom our way. It's your choice. It's your opportunity to do exactly that, to bring the kingdom more your direction. You say, well, pastor, how do I do that? Here's how you do it. Number one is that you invite his presence. Now you may say, well, I've already accepted Jesus as my savior and Lord. That's awesome. But each and every day when you get up, you invite his presence. You invite the Holy Spirit to come near to you, to continue to direct your path, to continue to help you in the way in which you need to go, that you submit your will to the Father and you say, Lord, I want your presence. I can't tell you how many times in the Old Testament the leaders that are being described in various passages say, Lord, I don't want to go unless you go before me unless you pave the way, unless your presence is there. Because they knew they they would fall flat on their face, that there was no way that it would happen the way that they would envision it to happen if God didn't go before them, because we all need God's help. We need God's presence. So I challenge you to start praying and bringing the presence of God into your marriage. Bring the presence of God into your family. Bring the presence of God even physically into your home. You may say, well, how do you do that? Uh, Start anointing your house. Start praying the prayer, Lord, Spirit of God, come into this place. And anyone who comes through these doors would sense your presence. They would sense your peace. They would sense your love. They would sense your mercy. They would sense this as they come into our home, that there would be something different about this home. The presence of God. The really cool thing as well is that we could take up the authority. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And and the really cool thing is that authority can be yours. You say, well, how is that the case? So when we pray, you, you don't have access to God because of who you are. You have access to God because of what Jesus has already done. That it's in the name of Jesus that we have that authority. That Jesus is our high priest. You, you don't need to worry about going to, to, to a priest. You don't need to worry about going to a pastor. The pastor doesn't have to pray for you. A priest doesn't have to pray for you. You can pray yourself. But as you pray yourself, Jesus is your high priest. And so he's the one who gives you access. He's the one that you need to pray in his name. It's his name that gives you authority. Gives you opportunity. I, I think about how important it is that, that we take things back where the enemy has maybe advanced some territory, maybe in your life, maybe in your family, maybe in your job, maybe maybe in your workplace, whatever the case may be, that you start praying that, that, that God would be loosed in that place, that God would have his presence there. And in the midst of that, that things that have happened that should not be taking place, that you bind that in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that whatever is bound on earth can be bound in heaven. Whatever's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. That, that we're fighting a battle that's not about flesh and blood. It's not about peace. It's about the power of God. It's about the authority that you can have in Jesus' name. And because of that authority, the power then starts to flow. The power flows. Jesus modeled it for us when he prayed over people possessed with demons. It was his presence. In fact, even even his presence at times manifest what the enemy said back to them, back to him. And, And he took authority over it and he bound the enemy and he cast demons out and he he did all of those things in the in the midst of and, and the power of God is evidence. The power of God flowed. The presence, the authority, the power is exactly what God wants to do 
in your life today that we don't need to just wait to what is yet to come in the kingdom, but he has brought the kingdom near. And so we can exercise that authority. We can walk in that. The choice for us then, very simply today, as we conclude this, is for us to realize it's always about his kingdom. It's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's about his kingdom and his righteousness. I can't help but close it off with the couple of verses that Jesus said, this then is how you should pray as he taught all of us the Lord's prayer. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we make that our prayer each and every day. Lord, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about your kingdom. It's about what you want. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, today, we take this moment as we bow in prayer and as we think about the opportunity to just seal this message and this series within our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the kingdom. Thank you for how you brought the kingdom our way when you came first time. But thank you, Lord, that it's still more, so much more that is yet to come. I pray, Lord, that we would wrap our heads around this and, and keep our eyes fixed upon you in such a way that we would know that there is great inheritance that is in front of us. There's great blessing. And that we can look forward to that day that you will take over, that the clash of the kingdoms will come about and that you will win. And that when we are with you, that we're on the winning team. So Lord, help us to seal this in our hearts today as people who say, Lord, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Come. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings that you've given us. And on this Thanksgiving week, I pray that you would bless family after family after family and each one who is hearing this message and a part of this service today. Lord, that you would guide them and direct them and protect them. And friends, as we just bow our heads in God's presence today, if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, you can make that decision right now. You can settle this thing into your heart. The facts are very simple, that every one of us has messed up. That mess up is called sin. That sin puts a blemish on our lives. It's impossible for a sinful person to approach a holy God. And that's why Jesus came. He came to take away your sin. He came to give you eternal life. He came to bless you. He came to give you that inheritance. He came to change your circumstance and transform your life. Today, if you'd like to have a clean slate and a fresh start, if you'd like to have eternal life, if you wanna open up your life to Jesus, I challenge you to pray this prayer with me, a prayer that we pray every week, a prayer of commitment. Join me in this prayer today, if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus into this world to die upon a cross to forgive us of our sins. Today, Lord Jesus, I put my hope and I put my trust in you. Please forgive me of my sins and give me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe you rededicated your life to the Lord, Put in the chat line, I did it, I did it. You made that decision for Christ. We want to celebrate with you. We want to thank you for making the best decision you could ever make. Make yourself known to us. Let that be out. Tell a friend. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll send you a Bible. We'll get one in your hand. We want to help you in your walk with the Lord. We encourage you to pick up that New Testament, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. The second Gospel goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The Gospel of Mark. Start reading there and let it be just speaking into your life. God bless you. This kingdom concept is amazing. May we continue to allow the goodness of what God has said to us in his word today speak into our hearts throughout this week and this amazing holiday season of Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. God bless you. Have an awesome day. 
That was such a great message from our pastor. I hope that message blessed you as much as it blessed me. If it did, please feel free to share this video with your family and friends. Can you guys believe that already wraps up the Kingdom series? This month is just flying by. Speaking of this month flying by, this Thursday is our Thanksgiving outreach. If you would like to volunteer, simply call the church office or if you would like to donate towels blankets or jackets click the link below well that's all for me from my family to yours have a happy thanksgiving